a couple of years ago, I read in the news a tragic story of a couple called Larry and Darcy. They were committed Christians, but they were going through a really hard time. Their daughter was seriously ill and needed help with her medical bills. Larry himself had health problems. His business was also struggling and his car and his van had broken down in the same week. They needed help. And so one night, Larry turned on a Christian cable TV program where a preacher promised that God would reward their faith with wealth and health. All they needed to do was to pledge a specific amount of money to this man's ministry as a seed. That would demonstrate their faith and would guarantee their miracle. Larry was desperate. So he sent off a check. Then another one. Over the next few years, Larry and his wife Darcy, they actually gave over $20,000 to various individuals and ministries. All in the hope of getting his miracle. But the miracle never came. Larry's business fell apart because his spinal problems made, he, made it impossible for him to continue to work. As a result, they only barely make ends meet. And after being unable to help with his daughter's medical bills, his relationship with her just completely broke down. So what went wrong? Why did their miracle not come? Was it, as those who make these kind of promises say, because they didn't pray enough? Or they didn't give enough? Or they didn't have enough faith? Or was it because those people who promise a miracle were misrepresenting God's plan and purpose? Were they just con men who get rich by deceiving vulnerable people out of their money with false teaching and false promises? Unfortunately, Larry and Darcy are not an isolated case. All over the world, these sorts of promises are being made by proponents of what's called the prosperity gospel. All over the world, it's spreading rapidly. If you give enough, if you pray enough, if you believe enough, then God will give you all the health and wealth and happiness that you want. And people often point to the Bible to try and back up what they're saying. They show numerous examples where in response to a desperate prayer or to confident faith, God stepped in to miraculously heal and rescue and protect and provide. And we've even seen some of those incredible examples as we've worked through Hebrews chapter 11. Seen God at work in the lives of Noah and Enoch and Abraham and, and, and Moses. But why does this not always happen? Why do some people experience a miracle and others suffer? Is it really because of a lack of giving? Or a lack of prayer? A lack of faith? Well, as the writer of this letter concludes this chapter... He speaks into this struggle of a better faith. So we're going to read it now together. Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to break into the chapter of verse 32. If you have a Bible, please do open it up and read it together. If not, just listen. And Tony's going to come up and he's going to read it to us this morning. Thanks, Tony. Hebrews 11, 32 to the end. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, 
and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced cheers and flogging, while others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. But they were all commended for their fate, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Thank you very much, Tony. We spent the last three weeks uh, in this letter of Hebrews working through this extraordinary chapter. It's called a Hall of Faith. Just seeing men and women of incredible faith right down through the Bible in the Old Testament. But we've really just scratched the surface of those people. There are so many more examples that the writer could have used from Scripture. And so to conclude, the writer mentioned just a few more. He said, I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, or Barak, or Samson, or Jephthah, or David, or Samuel, or the prophets. The first four of these men were from the book of Judges in the Old Testament. A a very dark time in the nation of Israel. But despite this, each of them, through faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice. They did incredible things. Gideon, for example. He didn't feel feel very strong or courageous. And yet, by faith, he defeated the massive Midianite army who had invaded and oppressed his nation. And he did it with just 300 men. And they had a, a flaming torch and a trumpet as their weapons. Or Barak, he was initially very hesitant to face the Canaanites forces that oppressed his people for 20 years. But with Deborah's encouragement and her support, he won a great victory. Then it was Samson. Well, Samson, he was a very complex character. He struggled as a result of his weakness of his character and his commitment to God. And yet despite this, through his faith, he expressed incredible strength in defeating the Philistines even in his death. Jephthah, he was another complex guy. He made a very foolish and terrible vow to the Lord. And yet through his faith in the Lord, he defeated the Ammonite army. Each of these leaders had weaknesses and faults. Each of them faced overwhelming enemies and situations that seemed impossible. And yet God worked powerfully through each of them to bring salvation to their people. King David, he also had many faults and many feelings. And yet, the Bible describes him as a man after God's own heart. And he saw God work in power through him to deliver his people from their enemies. His most famous uh, victory, of course, is when he faced up to Goliath with nothing more than a sling and a stone and an incredible faith in God. He was one whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies, as verse 34 says. And so David and all the others, they encourage us to believe in the power of God to work in our lives despite or maybe even through our weaknesses. As the Lord spoke to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. 
our limitations, our weaknesses, our problems are not a barrier to God working in our lives. Instead, it's the opposite. They are opportunities for God's power to be more clearly revealed in each one of us. But this miraculous faith was not just described or just not just expressed in judges or kings. It's also seen by the prophets. God's spokespeople. The people who stood and spoke for God in the nation. Samuel, he was an incredible prophet who started to listen to God's voice when he was just a kid. And all through his life, he led his nation by faith. He spoke in between those years, between the judges and the kings, and had a very crucial ministry. There were also other prophets who also saw God work powerfully in their lives. For example, there was Elisha, who escaped the edge of the sword, as it says in verse 34. The town where Elisha was staying was surrounded by a strong force with horses and chariots, and they were there to capture him. And his servant, he started to panic. But Elisha told him, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Because Elisha could see the armies of God, the angel armies all around. And in response to Elisha's prayer, this enemy army were blinded until he led them helplessly into the capital city of Samaria, where they were captured. And these events, they remind us that we too don't need to be afraid. Even when we are surrounded by those who oppose us, even when we're surrounded by people who want to attack us or put us down, we can trust that God is able to protect His servants. This was the encouragement given to Paul when he was in the city of Corinth when he was overwhelmed by the challenges of preaching the gospel in that, that city. This is what the Lord said to Paul. He said, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one is going to harm you. Because I have many people in this city. As we were thinking about last week, as we go out into our family situations, into our schools, our colleges, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, we do not need to be afraid. Jesus is with us. And in his hands, we are safe. And this truth, it's not just for judges or kings and prophets. This is for ordinary, everyday people like us too. People like Daniel. Daniel was a prisoner of war in Babylon. And yet despite the threat of being thrown into the the den of lions, he consistently prayed to God. And even when this threat was carried out, he still trusted in God. And so by faith he shut the mouths of lions. Daniel's three friends were called Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They were thrown into a blazing furnace when they refused to bow down to this idol that the king of Babylon had set up. But they were completely unhurt. Because by faith they quenched the fury of the flames. As it says in verse 34. And then even more, incredibly, this faith was expressed when women received back their dead, raised to life again. The widow of Zarephath, the woman of Shunem, 
They both received their sons back from the dead through the ministry of Elijah and Elisha. Each of these incidents in the Bible, each of these examples, they show that as the angel said to Mary, nothing is impossible with God. These examples, they all demonstrate that our God is the God of the impossible. And of course, the ultimate demonstration of this is what we looked at last week. When God raised our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, from the dead. So because of the miraculous resurrection of Jesus, we can trust in His incomparably great power for us who believe. God has this power for us. What is that power? Paul goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 1, this is the the power that is like the working of His mighty strength. When he exerted, which he exerted in Christ, when he raised them from the dead. The power of God working in us is the very same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's the power that's in us. And so we, t- we can believe that there is no situation in our lives that God can't transform. There is no problem that's too difficult for him to solve. There is no barrier too great for him to overcome. There is no opposition that's too strong for him to defeat. Today we can depend on the God of miracles. That he can do far more than all we can ask or imagine. That's who our God is. He's still the God of miracles today. But we also need to understand that God doesn't always do exactly what we would like Him to do. Yes, some Old Testament believers, they experience incredible miracles. When they put their faith in God. But not everybody did. Other believers, they experienced incredible suffering. Some were persecuted in the most horrific ways. They were tortured and refused to be released. Faced jeers and flogging. While still others were chained and put in prison. In verse 35 it says. As a result, some of these believers suffered from extreme poverty. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. They didn't experience the good things of this life. Instead, they experienced hardship and hunger and humiliation and homelessness. Verse 38, they wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. They didn't live in nice houses. They didn't live in palaces. Instead, they were outcasts and exiles. And even worse, some were martyred. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. And of course, for the original readers of this letter, this wasn't just an ancient history lesson. Because this is what some of them had experienced, or watched them, those who they loved, experience. If you remember in chapter 10, the previous chapter, the writer said, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. So here's the question. Here's the struggle. Why did these people experience so much suffering? 
When others were miraculously rescued or delivered or protected. What did these people do wrong? Why didn't God step in with the miracles that they needed? Just like he'd done with loads of others. And I think if we're honest, many of us struggle with this. This is not an abstract problem. This isn't just something that somebody in a, in a, writing an academic paper would, would struggle over. This is a very real issue for many of us. It leads us to ask questions like, why are some people healed when I continue to suffer? Why is my life so tough when other people, they just seem to get everything that they want? Why is my family still rejecting Christ? Well, a lot of people see all their loved ones come to faith. Why is my church struggling? Well, other churches seem to be experiencing revival. However we uh, phrase that, whatever issue that we're, we're struggling with in particular, it makes us wonder, am I not praying enough? Am I not giving enough? Am I not believing enough? Well, that's what the prosperity teachers want us to think. And also that's what sometimes we feel deep down in our heart. That somehow it must be our fault. What are we doing wrong? Why can't we see God work in power in our lives like other people do? We long for a simple answer to this very complex and painful question. But in a sense, this passage doesn't give us a simple answer. It doesn't really try to answer the question of why. Why this person? Why that person? doesn't try to answer the question of why, why is God's will different for one person than for another. But what it does do, it clearly teaches us that we must not jump to the conclusion that it's because of a lack of faith. See what it says in verse 39? I think it's a very key verse that we need to uh, note. It declares that these were all commended for their faith. All of them. Some believers, they experience incredible miracles because of their faith in God. But others, they went through incredible suffering because of their faith in God. All of them were praised by God for having faith in Him. So we mustn't judge our faith or anybody else's faith by our circumstances or our wealth or our health or our happiness or our popularity or our effectiveness in evangelism or ministry or answers to prayer or family life or any visible or, or outward sign. Because if we do it, if we do measure faith by that, then we're not following how God measures faith. In fact, the writer says here about those who suffered. That the world was not worthy of them. These men and women of faith, they did not experience a miracle of healing or deliverance or provision or protection. But through their suffering, they honoured God. In remarkable ways, because it often takes more faith to endure than it does to escape. It takes more faith to go through the suffering than it does to avoid the suffering. This is what Jesus himself did, wasn't it? 
as we're thinking about last Friday night, and as we'll see next, in next chapter, in Hebrews chapter 12, Jesus was completely faithful. And so he went to the cross. And he suffered an agony and shame for each one of us. He wasn't rescued from that. He wasn't protected from that. He had to endure that. He willingly endured that. Because he trusted in God. And we are called to follow in his footsteps. And so despite the suffering and the struggling, the pain and poverty, the rejection and the ridicule, these people, they endured. They persevered. So that they might gain a better resurrection. Through their suffering, they showed that they were trusting in a God who could keep His promises, even if they had to go through death to receive them. They believed that God is faithful to all that He has said. Even if it means he has to raise them from the dead for them to experience those promises. That's faith. And ultimately, that's the better faith that each one of these people in Hebrews chapter 11 expressed. Because whether they experienced miracles or whether they went through incredible suffering, each one of them each one of them had to express this long-term faith because none of them received what had been promised. Why could he say that? Well, it's because God had promised far more than what any of them had experienced in their lifetime. Far more than a temporary place of rest from their enemies. Far more than a temporary healing of their bodies. Far more than a partial and limited experience of God's presence in their lives. God had promised them all something better than that. And none of them experienced it in their lifetime. Abel, he was killed by his, uh, by his own brother. Enoch, he was taken from this life. Abraham, he died before he got into the promised land. Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, they too died when they were still waiting. Even Moses, he got to the, the very border of the promised land, but he didn't get in. And in all the rest, they all died. None of them experienced what God was promising. Why was that? Well, look at verse 40. It was because God had planned something better for us. So that only together with us would they be made perfect. Down through history, over the centuries, God has been building a community of people who would one day experience all that He has promised. This is the day that all of God's people are looking forward to. What is that day? When Jesus will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to all who are waiting for Him. This is the better that we are looking forward to. Not a temporary rest from our enemies. But the ultimate Sabbath rest for the people of God. Not a temporary physical healing. But the day when He will wipe away every tear from our eyes because there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things have been passed away. Not a partial and limited experience of God's presence but the full enjoyment of intimacy with God. Because then the dwelling of God will be with men and He will live with them. That's the better that we are waiting for. That's the better that we're called to hold on to. That's the better that we're called to believe in. Not just what we might have now, 
But what God has promised, one day, when Jesus comes back again. And so we need to do the same as what these believers in Hebrews 11 did. All these people were still living by faith when they died. Each of them, whether they experienced the miracle or whether they went through the suffering, they all persevered in faith. They kept on believing in God right to the end. And so one day they will experience all that God has promised. And we need that same persevering faith in our lives too. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God you will receive what He has promised. We need to keep believing in Jesus. Keep trusting in His sacrificial death on the cross and His glorious resurrection from the grave. Keep believing that He has done everything that's required for us to be made declared righteous in, in the sight of a holy God. Keep believing that Jesus is sufficient, that His grace is enough. Keep believing that He died for you. Because He will keep His promise. So some of us may see God work in miraculous ways in our lives. God is still the God of the impossible. We need to keep believing that God is able to do far more than we can ask or imagine. Others of us will go through times of incredible suffering. So we need to believe that the grace of Jesus is sufficient for us. That his resurrection power is at work in each one of our lives to enable us to endure no matter what the world throws at us. But all of us need that persevering faith. A faith that keeps on going no matter what. That keeps on believing that God's promise for us is better. Faith that holds on. Because Jesus has promised that he's coming back for us one day. And he is faithful to all of his promises.